So here's a little quirk of geometry. Watch me twist and slide. And what you just saw, that was really just one rotation in disguise. This is a general fact. No matter how many times you twist or slide something around, it can always be undone in just one elegant move. In this video, we will unravel why this is true. We will look at some circles, arrows, and we'll encounter a treacherous demon. Ready? Let's dive right in. So imagine you've got some shape and you're twisting and sliding it around, or to use the proper language that you're rotating and translating it. Sometimes it's obvious that you could undo your movement in a single step. For example, if the shape faces the same direction at the end as it started off with, all you need is a slide. Now if the shape faces a different direction at the end of the movement, it's easy to see that you could undo it in two steps. The way to do that is first you rotate the shape around its center and then you slide it back. So two steps, always possible, and going from two step to one step is the real challenge. With that in mind, let's rephrase what we actually want to show in this video. Theorem. Any movement that consists of a rotation followed by a translation can be mimicked by a single rotation about some point. We will prove that this is true by breaking the problem into two parts. First, we will show that whenever you combine a rotation with a translation, there is exactly one point in the plane that is fixed, that is not affected by your combined movement. And then we will make the case that if any movement whatsoever has this property, that it keeps exactly one point fixed, then that movement must necessarily be a rotation. All right, let's dive into this idea that combining a rotation with a translation leaves one point fixed. Let's take a closer look at the first part of the movement, the rotation. We know it fixes its center of rotation and every other point swirls around it. Now let's visualize where points go using arrows. Think about the distance each point must travel as it rotates. Points near the center, they don't go very far. But the further out you go, the longer the journey. Thus the distance from the center point determines the length of the arrow. Points with equal distance from the center of rotation travel the same distance. But as we move along the circle, the direction of the arrow changes. Now, picture any arrow shape you like, and I claim that there will be a spot on the plane somewhere that will make that exact arrow. You can find the spot by adjusting the distance from the center until you match the length of the arrow, and then rotating around the circle until you match the direction of the arrow. And what's more, there is only one spot where you can match the arrow exactly. Any other point on the same circle would give you an arrow with a different direction, and any other point outside the circle would give you an arrow with a different length. This is the key observation. Now, to understand the combined effect of the rotation plus the slide, let's add a second arrow to the first. This second arrow, always unchanging, shows us where points get taken by the translation. And here's the magic. There must be some point in the plane where the rotation's arrow is the exact opposite of the translation's arrow. Meaning, at this spot, the effect of the rotation perfectly undoes the effect of the translation. That is our fixed point. So now we're ready to move on to the second part of our proof. We will start by observing that both rotations and translations share a very important trait. They don't distort shapes. In mathematical jargon, you would say that they are transformations that preserve the distances between points. And if both rotations and translations have this property, then the combination of them must have it too. It turns out that this property is very important for the rest of our proof. What we will show now is that any transformation that preserves distances and keeps exactly one point fixed must always be a rotation. But as the waters get deeper, we'll navigate this with a more narrative approach. 
you find yourself in a heated debate with a treacherous demon. This demon is boasting loudly that he knows of a distance-preserving transformation that fixes exactly one point, but is not a rotation. You are angered by this because you are absolutely convinced this cannot be true. So you agree to a game. The rules are simple. Initially, the demon reveals the location of the fixed point of his mystery transformation. In each following round, you are allowed to ask the demon questions about his enigmatic transformation. If you're ever able to catch the demon in a lie, that means demonstrate to the demon that his replies have been contradictory, you win the game. However, if you're unable to catch him in a lie, well, let's just say it won't be pretty. Contemplating your strategy, you initiate the first round. You pick some random point, let's call it A, and you ask the demon where this point gets sent by his mystery transformation. Now the demon replies with the coordinates for A prime. Immediately, you check if A prime lies on the same circle around the fixed point C as A did. If not, then you know that the distance between A and C and A prime and C has changed. Which is an obvious lie. But the demon is smarter than to fall for such obvious traps, so he gives you some believable answer for A prime. If you are correct, the demon's description must be the rotation that shifts A to A prime. But the demon reiterates that his transformation isn't that rotation. Grudgingly, you plan your next move. You ask the demon about the midpoint between A and A prime, let's call it B. Where does that point go? Now before the demon has time to reply, you instantly pinpoint that using the distance preservation rule and the fact that C is the only point that is allowed to get fixed, there is only one location where B can be sent. Let's call that B prime. So thus far you have learned that the triangle ABC gets sent to the triangle A prime B prime C. The demon's description is indistinguishable from your rotation so far. Yet he persists that there is a distinction. You keep your poker face. Although the demon doesn't realize it yet, he has given himself away already. It turns out that knowing where this one triangle gets sent gives you enough information to figure out where every other point in the plane must go. To see why this is true, let's pick some random point D and let's work out where it gets sent. First, we will measure the distances from D to the points A, B and C. Now we know that D must be sent to a point that preserves these distances. So if you draw circles around A prime, B prime and C with those distances as radii, then you know that D must be sent to a point where all three circles intersect. Now the right question to ask yourself at this point is, is it possible for three circles to intersect in more than one point? As that would mean that there is no way to unambiguously figure out where points get sent. So let's work this question out first. Starting with just two circles, we observe that they can intersect in at most two points. Clearly then, there is no way for three circles to intersect, and by that I mean all intersect, in more than two points. And it turns out that the only way for three circles to all intersect in two points is if the center points of the circles lie on the same line. Now you should check this for yourself, but unless the demon has told you some very obvious lie, the triangle A prime B prime C will always be a real triangle in the sense that the vertices will not lie on the same line. Let's pause and think about what we just learned. Starting with some random point D and using the circle method, we can unambiguously work out where D gets sent. Now this method we have devised is very general. It applies to all transformations that take the triangle ABC to A prime B prime C, leave one point fixed and preserve distances. In particular, this method doubles as a way to calculate the effect of our rotation that takes the triangle ABC to A prime B prime C. 
It is time for your finishing move. You challenge the demon. Show me a point where your transformation differs from that of the rotation. Regardless of the demon's answer, you can demonstrate that it is inconsistent with his previous declarations. Either the point he gave you does not actually differ from the rotation, or it must violate the distance preservation property. So you win the game, and you have proved that any distance preserving transformation that fixes exactly one point must be a rotation. So to recap everything we have done so far, we have shown that the combination of a rotation and a slide fixes exactly one point, and since it preserves distances between points, it must necessarily be a rotation. So thanks for watching and I hope I'll see you in the next video.